All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think several of you have, have uh, seen some of these uh, before, so but I just have a really short uh, introduction before we get jump right into it. Uh, my name is Dave Cook. I'm the Director of Undergraduate Research here at UAH. And what we're doing this week is uh, presenting an opportunity uh, in which students like you can see what's happening in our summer community of scholars. So this is a project that we have at UAH in which a undergraduate student can work with a faculty or a UAH researcher all during the summer. Uh, and um, this is really great because Michael, I was just talking to him before this, he's actually doing this in the summer between his freshman and sophomore year. So it's really possible to get involved in undergraduate research very early at UAH. And I asked him, you know, how he did it. And he said, he just went to talk to Dr. Caspery and said, hey, that's pretty cool what you're doing. I kind of did something like that in high school. And, you know, Dr. Caspery is the kind of person that when you take that initiative and show some interest, and I'm sure he put Michael through, you know, a couple tests and to see how dedicated he was. But, you know, once he saw that he had a genuine desire to learn with, you know, hands-on, you know, cutting edge technologies, uh, you know, he gave him a shot for the summer program. So yeah, I strongly encourage you if you uh, are coming here to UAH to look into the program. Just before we sign off, I'll put a, a link in the chat that um, talks more about the program so that you can look into it. Um, but anyway, uh, enough of me talking about that. Let me turn it over to the presenters and let them tell you about their really cool experiment they're working on this summer. Go ahead, Michael, take it away. Okay, uh, so hi, I'm Michael Canary. Uh, I'm a, gonna be a sophomore here at UAH and I'm studying to be an aerospace engineer. And my project is studies and additive manufacturing techniques for pulse fusion experiments. Uh, my mentor is Dr. Caspery. Do you wanna say so stuff about who you are? Sure, uh, uh, a lot of these names are, are very familiar. I think we just spoke about uh, an hour ago. So nice to see all, all of you again. So I'm a professor, I didn't introduce myself last time. So I'm a professor at University of Alabama Huntsville in mechanical and aerospace engineering. I am affiliated with the Propulsion Research Center. My background is primarily in uh, pulsed fusion, uh, numerical modeling, and uh, pulse power experiments. And as you've seen, we're starting to dabble in other interesting high voltage applications. Uh, so, but anyway, this particular one is exciting to us because we're, we're looking at ways of adding um, or creating specialized uh, fusion fuel, what we call targets. These are things that we would drive massive amounts of current through to generate uh, fusion neutrons, which can be used for uh, helping us to develop terrestrial power and propulsion concepts, but also uh, in the more near term, we can use neutrons to actually do imaging and sensing of stuff that's shielded. So for example, this would be a security thing where we can look through shipping containers without actually having to dig in them to determine if there's any kind of uh, dangerous uh, material on board. Um, and, uh, and so what Michael is doing is really important for helping us to develop these capabilities. So. All right, go for it, Michael. Okay, so the goal for this uh, project is to be able to create fusion ignition targets that have a set mass of fuel in a specific pattern. And then we can use in the, our pulsed power machine to generate fusion neutrons to start fusion reactors, fusion rocket engines and do imaging. So to, when we initially started this, there are like two big types of additive manufacturing there is the 3D printing, and then there's the physical vapor deposition. So uh, to start with 3D printing, this was my initial thought of how to do all, like to actually create the targets. So on the left is one of a 3D printer I own, and that's showing one of the uh, FDM fused deposition uh, method printing where it takes a plastic, it melts it, and then it sort of it and it builds it up layer by layer. And then there's also resin, which we have, which uses light and a and a photoresist or a photo like resin that hardens to uh, like create a uh, a shape or a part layer by layer. So 
and then with the physical vapor deposition, there are two main types we are trying to do. There is uh, sputtering and thermal deposition. And all physical vapor deposition is, is you take a source material, and in this case, lithium, it's either gonna be a solid or a liquid. We evaporate that, turn it into a gas, and then we transport that gas to the target where we're trying to make or make that uh, fusion target and it turns back into a solid. So to start with thermal deposition, you, uh, you this is all in a vacuum because you have to tr have that those ions for the evaporated material try to go up and stick to your holder. And if there's any gas in the way, especially if you use lithium, it's gonna react with the oxygen very quickly. So you have to have a very deep vacuum and preferably have an, a little bit of an atmosphere that is an oxygen, something like argon. So this is one, this is one type we're gonna do. We tried, and I have uh, an example of it that we tried later. The other type is sputtering. Now this is a little more complex because it involves magnetic fields and high, volt and high voltage while the other required high current. Uh, this uses the argon molecules that are in the in the chamber. This is also at a very low vacuum. Uh, I'm trying to figure out this stuff. So, okay, I'm trying to remember. Um, in an atmosphere, there is we have a unit of pressure called tor. There are 760 tor in an atmosphere. What we're trying to get down to, what allows it to start being worked at is about 100 millitor, which is a thousand, uh, 100 times smaller than a tor. So we, act, we need very low pressures for th this to work. So for sputtering, you take the argon ions, it hits your sputtering target, in this case, lithium, and it knocks those, those lithium atoms out. It gets trapped in magnetic field, and then it gets shot up to what you're trying to hit with the lithium and grows it. I also have an example of this. So for our first attempt, I tried to do sputtering since we had magnets and I had a vacuum, I had vacuum equipment. So it, we never, the main problem with this is it never got down to that low pressure. I couldn't get below 10 tor, which is too high for anything to actually start working. So I tested this with copper and it didn't work. And as you can see on the bottom copper plate, there's a little ring of plasma. So we got something where plasma could form, but not enough to actually do much with it. The main problem was there was a lot of leaks in the system that just destroyed the vacuum. There's, we used epoxy that might've been, uh, might've been something that kept the vacuum high or yeah. And also there's brass, which sink can sometimes leave and ruin the vacuum. So the next attempt that I tried to do was thermal deposition. So this is, we, I, f I found a way to upgrade the chamber. So hopefully it can hold a better vacuum. So far, I'm still having troubles with it. So on the far, on the left, that steel tube, that's the vacuum chamber. Then coming off of that is my vacuum attachments with the vacuum gauge some uh, valves to help control vacuum and a vacuum pump attached to that. On the bottom, since it uses high current, I have two bolts sticking up that hold a piece of copper tubing. I have a picture of that in the next slide. And I'm using a welder to power it since I need to get that copper very hot to, as I'm testing it. So, for the operation of attempt two, this was, I tried to put a piece of glass over top the copper and use it to coat. Uh, the main problem was there was still leaks, so I couldn't get a good vacuum. I didn't, I just, I, uh, uh, I can't run the vacuum chamber as the welder's running because it overloads the circuit breaker. And uh, what else was the main problem? I didn't have a, argon atmosphere. So a lot of the copper ions would be reacting with the oxygen to create copper oxide. But it was a good attempt. It, it allowed me to create something that sort of works. And I eventually, if I get things sorted out, it could work as 
a, pro a method to deposit lithium onto our targets. Now the future plans, we're gonna have a little bit better of a system. We're gonna have machined parts, better vacuum systems so we can have even deeper vacuums instead of going down to 100 millitor, we can get down to like one or even 10 to the minus one millitor and get even lower where you get into the ultra high vacuum ranges. We can use secondary pumps. Well, I'm gonna go back. Uh, the vacuum pump I currently have is a two stage, like just roughing pump that can get down to, I've gotten it down to about 50 millitor, but with a turbo molecular pump, which is like a jet engine without an electric jet engine, where it just compresses the air and just forces that out, or a diffusion pump, which uses like vaporized oil to sort of pull uh, the gas molecules down and compresses that and sends it out. This can get for uh, a cleaner coating because the ions can travel a lot farther and there's not as much stuff to for it to hit and ruin the surface coating. This also allows us so we can accurately predict how much material we, we need on because in the end, we're gonna need, uh, Dr. Casper, if this is correct, was it 10 to the minus? 10 to the minus one uh, milligram, no, yeah, milligrams of lithium that our capacitors can. Yeah, we'll, we'll need we'll need tens to hundreds of micrograms of, uh, of of fusion fuel in order to have a small enough amount to get to fusion relevant temperatures. Okay, so uh, future uses for this, this all ties it in together. Fusion reaction starters, I used a picture of a tokamak because that's the main one that's being built, but it can be used to like kickstart that reaction. It's almost like a match that then we can just continuously add fuel and it will allow the reaction to continue and we can turn it into a way to generate power. Or we can just eject all that out a nozzle and use it for, for very high efficiency propulsion to do deep space uh, exploration, Mars colonization, moon colonization, asteroid mining. And also, as Dr. Casper said, we could use it to scan like shipping containers to see if they're holding any uh, like illegal items or like nuclear things such as uranium that could, they could just shield with other things and they can't look through it with conventional means. So with that, does anyone have any questions? Uh, yes. I, uh, with, with this uh, sputtering, is it, excuse me, are you, do you have a model that you put in there that already has your shape or is there, are you trying to control how it builds kind of like a 3D printer, you know? Uh, okay, so it's a, it's a very good question um, because they do use this type for semiconductor manufacturing, for making the transistors. So in that, in that case, they use um, like a photoresist and then they use a light source and blockers to create that shape. And they put that under the sputtering and it, and it makes its part. But since photoresist uses acetone to, to get rid of it, we can't exactly use that to um, for lithium. So I've seen people use like tape and just cover off the part and just cut out what they actually want to be sputtered and it coats it. Then we can just tape off the tape and put it in the machine and fire. Thank you. Eventually, eventually you could probably do a mask over top and the thing and just pull it out and next slide comes in you you just continuously do that, just have a reusable slide. That actually could work. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I have a question, Michael. Okay. So you talked about uh, this as having some thrust potential in you know, powering uh, spaceships or something like that. So, you know, how much, thrust. I, I'm not quite sure what the units are, you know, 
pounds per, <laughs> I don't know how to talk about thrust, but is it a lot? Is it like a huge amount of thrust or I know like when you're in deep space, you don't need as much, but um, can you talk a little bit about what kind of potential it has as a, a thrusting technology? I mean, it's going to be pretty efficient. It's going to be very efficient. I don't know all the numbers because that's not my side of what I'm doing. But even if you get like 10,000 seconds of impulse, which is uh, you, you get the units from amount of fuel you put in per second per how much force you get out. So then you get pound, uh, like if you're doing pounds per second of input and you get pounds force out, it's pounds per second, like pounds per pounds per second. So then you get a unit of seconds. And so if you, if you have like 10,000 seconds of uh, specific impulse and you put in uh, one pound of fuel per second, you're going to get 10,000 pounds out. So it all depends on how efficient your engine is and how much, uh, and how, how efficient your engine is and how much fuel you put in per second. So I, uh, um, is it okay if I uh, yeah. help address that question? Okay, so very good question. Um, so thrust from a, a chemical rocket, it's pretty straightforward. You see fire and smoke coming out the exhaust. In the concepts that we're looking at, they're actually pulsed. It's a, it's a little bit harder. There's an extra step involved in order to try to figure out the thrust because instantaneously, when you have these pulses blast out the nozzle, uh, you get you get this you know jolt, but it's really not that bad because it's, it's not that much uh, force. And you pulse it like maybe 10 times a second. And so what you do is you, you figure out how much momentum comes out the exhaust, and then you multiply that times the frequency. So let's say 10, 10 pulses per second, and that would give you the, the thrust. And the thrust that you need for a given mission depends on your payload and the trip time. But a typical number would be, let's say, a thousand newtons of thrust would be a, about a typical thing for maybe a Mars mission or a Jupiter mission. It's not a huge amount of thrust, but it's the fact that you do this continuously and accelerate for months on end that you get up to speeds of like uh, 50 miles a second or something like that. I mean, you're moving very, very fast by the time you burn out to your final velocity. Thank you. So yeah, that, that's the, all the force aspects. It does depend on your mission. and That, that makes and sense. It, yeah, definitely not my field, but it's really interesting. Do you guys have any other questions? I, I, got an, I have another one. <laughs> so it seems to me like you're, you know, building some, uh, you know, equipment to test out this theory. So is the issue right now is that you, you don't know which is the best way or is it like you don't have the equipment that you need? You, you say you're trying to reach some parameters, but you can't. And I'm assuming because you don't have the, the right equipment or it doesn't exist yet or something like that. So, you know, what's the, yeah, I know you said the goal at the beginning and I, yeah. I forget what you said, but is the goal to figure out like which way is better or just uh, developing the method to do either way? It's Are just a, yeah. yeah, just be able to uh, create ignition targets that have a specific, ma specific mass of fuel. Mm -hmm. and so either way works. That's why I chose them. Uh, one thing, I, I had a picture of it and I forgot to put it in, but I did try so one of the fuels we use is lithium deuteride. So it's a lithium atom mixed in with a, a deuterium atom, which is just hydrogen with an extra neutron. And it's sort of made in a, into a crystal. It's actually used in thermonuclear bombs. So it's a good source of I fuel. I will neither confirm nor deny anything that's, that you just said. That's uh, I thought it's publicly accessed information, but OK. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I tried mixing that into um, the resin and the lithium reacted with the resin. So I couldn't work. I couldn't use it as just like have embedding it into the resin. They do this for ceramics and metal, some metal 3D printing where you just then bake out the 
resin to have your finished part in either ceramic or metal. And yeah, the, so that didn't work. Uh, 3D printing using like a, a 3D printer like I have, that wouldn't have worked out super well. It would have been a lot of complex of trying to get this lithium wire, which doesn't, which is very malleable and to try to flow through a nozzle that wouldn't have worked out super well. And also you would have high masses because you're like the nozzle is 0.4 millimeters wide. You can't really get hundreds of mi uh, micrograms of fuel coming out in like a specific pattern. It would be too big or too much. And then, yeah. So going back to the original question, it is a mixture of like trying to figure out which way to do. I like the sputter method because it doesn't require high current. So nothing's, it's not gonna melt as much and it looks a lot more professional and they use this in the semiconductor industry. But also I don't have the material, the, the resources right now to do sputtering. I'd have to machine a lot of parts. I think the, uh, the thing I showed in the future plans that requires like six or seven machined parts for just the sputter head. And I'm gonna have to have like a stainless steel vacuum chamber surrounding it, amounts for turbo, uh, whatever secondary pumps we use, all this extra stuff in it. So it's gonna be a highly manu like custom made part for this process. But then hopefully we can get up to making like hundreds of them, hundreds of them a day. And even do, even potentially do, one of my ideas is lithium, lithium deuteride sort of coating. So you react to the surface layer of lithium with deuterium and you coat it again in lithium and just continue the process up so you can get like layered if you need it. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so uh, as far as math goes, um, have you been doing, I guess, like a lot of electrical problems or? Uh, not a whole bunch of electrical problems. Uh, for the sputtering, my first attempt, I killed the diodes because I, the vacuum was too high, so I was drawing way too much current. And I also wanted to push it, trying to see if I could see if I can bake out some of the, the chambers because if you're getting to ultra high vacuums, then you start baking out where you like try to get the chamber really hot. So you can get those volatile molecules or like organic compounds to sort of just leave. And it didn't really work out and it killed the diodes. Um, for the spot, for the thermal deposition, using a welder, uh, it works. I mean, it turns the uh, copper bright orange, um, but I can't, I can't run the welder and the vacuum pump at the same time, which if I needed to do it for long, long coating, I couldn't do that or I'd have to put these on two breaker lines. And then uh, I guess for your, um, your manufacturing process with, I saw your future parts. Um, so are you planning on CNC machine like metal or? Yeah, it's gonna be uh, metal lays that and CNC machining since that's to be you can't really they're custom made so you don't really want to yeah make it and also oh, add be fun yeah technically you probably could do some additive manufacturing but metal 3d printing is incredibly expensive and it's probably yeah, better to start off with the solid yeah, and do subtract any other questions uh, just one more. Uh, when you, after sputtering, like, is it real pure? Like, is the layer considered like pure, or is does it have like little rem remnants of of uh, of other um, chemicals or, or gases that just wasn't able to get out of the chamber? I mean, in a perfect world where the, the vacuum is zero, there is no extra things, yeah, it would be pure. But so it, if I get the vacuum low enough, or if I get a high, oh, vacuum's weird, you have to get it, a high, if I get a high enough vacuum, then there's gonna be less impurities. And if I design the sputter head correctly, then there could be, there will be even less impurities. So it is just trying to get, like just the surface, the material you're trying to sputter 
to the surface and try to get it with as little stuff being kicked in as possible. There's going to be some contaminants, but hopefully not enough to damage the system. I mean, with the the attempt, the second attempt, it wouldn't have worked for anything because there's too much air. It would ruin the it would ruin the process. You wouldn't get pure copper. You get copper oxide layers. So yeah, with, you need a very high vacuum so you can get as lo, little contaminants as possible. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, well, I'm going to uh, put in the chat uh, a link to the summer program, a link to the summer program. So again, uh, please check it out. Uh, definitely, if you're going to be a, a UAH student, this is something that you can apply for uh, while you're here. Uh, and either way, uh, hopefully we'll have a poster session this fall. And so you'll uh, be able to meet Michael and Dr. Caspery and talk to them about their research. Uh, in the worst case, uh, they're also, uh, Michael's uh, creating a, uh, a video to talk more about his uh, research. And, and sometimes when the students make the video, they'll put their email on there or something. So if you do have further questions, you can contact them. So, uh, but I'm, I'm really hoping that we can have the poster session. So um, when we know uh, uh, the time and the place for that, uh, I'll let everybody know. So uh, Michael, Dr. Casper, thank you very much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, again, if you have any questions, yeah, thank you uh, yeah, my contact information is on that uh, that web link, and you've got it from the reminder email. So uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Nice meeting you all. Excellent questions. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.